Question number two, what can you tell me about the church in Etienne, France, or the area in uh, um, Etienne, France? And I'm trying to get the pronunciation correct. correct. Saint Etienne de Rouge, near Rouen in Normandy, at the church of Saint Stephen, that Father Jacques Hamel was martyred at yesterday by an Orthodox Muslim. Well, that's a very interesting story. And I wrote about it on Shubat.com. I have a piece up on it. Uh, you can read it. But here's what happened. Basically, this guy, a Muslim guy, his name was Adil Kermish. He broke into the church while Mass was going on, along with two other Muslims. So said two, there may, be, there may have been more. They take the priest. The priest tries to fight them. They slit his throat while he's saying Mass and are screaming Allah Akbar and then give a sermon. This was what you call Muslim ritual sacrifice. He was ritually murdered for Allah. Let's call it what it is. This was a sacrifice to a de to the demon god Allah. Okay? That's why they did it. This was all religious. Don't kid yourself. This wasn't political. This wasn't because they didn't have enough education. It wasn't because they came from a deprived background. It wasn't because they just need more scholarships. It's because this is Islam. This is the true faith and what it leads to. I said many times, you and your listeners can go into the archive and they can become a founder's past member. And you can hear it. What I've said is the logical natural fruit of Islam, practiced by a man who truly wants to follow to its final conclusion, is what you just saw in France. That's part of it. As far as the congregation, there's a, as far as the area, there's a lot. It's very heavily Catholic. And what's most interesting, it's not being talked about, except for very little, except in the British press, is the, this young Muslim man, Adil Kermish. He was an Arab, a uh, Moroccan. But he was inspired to do this by a man, an, another man. This man's name was uh, Maxime. And this Maxime, he, Maxime, um, let me see if I can find it, Haushad. Maxime Haushad was a former Catholic who turned Muslim when he was 17, converted to Islam, went to join ISIS, and you can find videos of him splitting people's throats online. You know, the ones where they have the blood coming out and people are screaming. Really? Yes, you can look up Maxime Haushad, and you will find him along with another Portuguese apostate from the Catholic faith, who, uh, again, another, again, another young man, converted to Islam by the name of Mikael dos Santos. And it's interesting because Mr. Haushad not only was in contact with, Mr. with Adil, but he was also from the same area. I think he was about 20 miles south. So he grew up in all this area. This is all rural countryside. Okay. People all knew each other. Most likely, he was involved in the attack somehow. Now what, now, what about now the area that uh, you say is heavily Catholic? This is the area around Normandy, right? That is correct. It's in the Normandy, Brittany area of France. This is traditionally very Catholic. You have a lot of people here who are actually of English background, but they are uh, Francophone and French culturally speaking. Um, again, very interesting roots in this area. So what you see here is an attack in one of the heartlands of French Catholicism. And it was, it was done at this church because, again, the priest is an old man. They probably knew they could get him. Remember, Muslims, I wrote an article this morning about a woman in India who fought off a Muslim and was trying to rape her, and then she castrated him. And one of the points I made is that the reason why Muslims attack people is because they think they're weak. They're like hyenas. They only attack those who they think they can overpower. And that's also why they attack in groups. So... Understanding is they, they attacked an old man, so they figured they could beat him up, and they thought the people in the parish wouldn't fight back. Now, I want to add to that by saying, when you see Muslims do stuff like this, that's an act of war. They're calling your bluff, like in poker. They're saying, we just did this. What you going to do about it? That's how they're calling. And, and your refusal to act, to respond to them, is your consent to submission to what they have done. It's your acceptance of what they have done. I'm trying to get this through people's heads. Just sitting around and doing what the official statement the Vatican said, said we can't pick up arms and we can't, we just have to pray and be good to others, be good to these people. We cannot stand up to them. That is a sin. That is a heresy. I am telling you straight up. You know, Mike, I have my book, Lions of the Faith. It's available on Kindle, Saints, Blessings, and Heroes of the Catholic Faith and the Struggle with Islam. You can get it on Amazon Kindle. Read the book. I have hundreds of saints in their chronicles. Yes, there were martyrs, and there were people were missionaries, people who prayed for Muslims, but I have many saints who were warrior saints, 
saints who went into battle to fought to fight these people in physical combat I am saying if we do not address the Muslim situation now it is going to come to that or conversion to Islam get that through your heads this is uh, the voice of Andrew Bizad and if you're watching us on YouTube then you're watching the uh, the personage of Andrew Bizad who is the author of Lions of the Faith get it as a Kindle download at Amazon.com. Uh, we're going to get some printed copies of this book at some point in time, and Andrew's going to send them to me, and I'm going to put them in the Founders Trading Post. And the first one is going to get them. You're going to fly out of there. It's a great book. Um, I do have a copy of it. Uh, I'd like to read something to you. This is uh, from Jean Duquesne, writing in Alicia, uh, Alicia's French edition. I translated this using Google Translate, so it may be a little sketchy. Uh, Jean Duquesne is the executive director for the Catholic Academy in France and a founder of the French edition of the magazine uh, Communio. And he wrote this yesterday. What just happened in saint antillon de rouret can only provoke horror and even anger at such hatred uh, that is as cowardly as it is cruel and stupidly suicidal. After so many terrorist attacks in France but also in Germany, it is permissible to note that in this case, the lunatics have not killed completely blind. This is to your point, Andrew, and he makes it for you, too. Until now, the fanatics had, had attacked some flattering idea that our citizens have of themselves. The iconoclastic insolence of Charlie Hebdo, the pagan cult of sports in the Stade de France, and the happy-go-lucky Bataclan and Café Terraces of the 11th uh, arrondissement. Um, at on decement, Bobo of Paris, the fireworks of July 14th in Nice, celebrating a revolution that promoted ideals but also produces worse. Here today, though, is something quite different. The purpose of the condemnation was not the West in general, nor its complacent and selfish prosperity, which may seem insulting to the poor of the world. This was an attack at the root of of European civilization, our very living source, if we forget what throughout history, quietly but irresistibly, it refreshes us explicitly and most intensely, the celebration of the Holy Mass. We must therefore ask, will the French and others identify with these victims, an elderly priest brutally murdered, and a handful of faithful and religious? Dare we say, I am Father Jacques Hamel, as it was proclaimed and repeated over and over again. I am Charlie Hebdo. Christians, for their part, can only be shocked and outraged as any civilized human being, but also shaken because they are now justified in thinking that their Eucharistic assemblies are now in the crosshairs of those plagued by murderous impulses and stimulated by a delirious propaganda. Christians once again find themselves confronting, as no one could wish or expect, the mystery of evil in its most naked brutality, the unbearable enigma that love is not loved, as revealed that cross was left, na that, that, uh, uh, as revealed that cross was left nailed, their Lord. Now, when I hear this, and when I hear what you say, is it far? Is it? Is it? it, it would it be far fetched and alarmist to uh, to to think that very soon we're going to be? I'm going to be. You're going to be uh, lamenting and praying for the so the repose of souls that were taken out in uh, Europe somewhere, or in the United States, or somewhere else, uh, where, where, wherever there are Muslims roaming the streets that can go orthodox, that were simply celebrating a Sunday Mass? Well, the first thing I have my shot of whiskey. <laughs> now that I have my shot, here's my answer. The man had some good things to say. He's missing a couple of critical parts. Okay. Well, first off, I was saying, you know me, I've been saying this for years. I have been talking for years about their, the purpose is not the West. It's not Charlie Hebdo. They don't hate us for our freedom. They hate us for you, and they want your soul. They want your soul and your kids' souls. They want you bowing to Mecca with them. They want you to worship their demon god. That is what Islam is, plain and simple. You want to know what it is? 
They want your wife in that and your daughters in that veil and your sons in a kafiyah and a jilbab. That is where they want your you and your kids. That's what it comes down to. They were coming for your soul. Point blank. Second, yes, it does inspire horror. It's it's not good. It's very scary. It's meant to be scary. Quran chapter 8 verse 12, if I'm not mistaken. Sanalki arab fi quluba ladina kafaru. Allah said, we will strike terror into the hearts of the infidels. And then he adds, after we will smite off their necks and all of their appendages. Of course it's meant to scare you. That is what Islam does. Like I've said, it's a weak religion that runs by fear and submission. It's meant to terrorize you into submission. And do you know how you respond to that? When the enemy runs at you of any kind, you don't run away. You run at him. That is the way you respond to Islam. I don't care if it's just one person. You run at them. You attack. This is not the time to sit back and say, oh, well, we just need to pray for them and do this. Yes, we need to pray. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't. We need to pray. We need to go back to church and do our, and do our devotions, our adoration, our novenas, our rosary, daily, daily rosary, wearing the brown scapular like I have on right now. If you're not familiar with it, look it up, the brown scapular. You can read more about it at Fatima.org. But if, very importantly, you must take what your faith says and follow in the example of the saints that I wrote about in Lions of the Faith. Take your faith and apply it. If you're not sure if w what you're doing is acceptable, read my book. There were saints who were great holy men, very great people, people who are in heaven. That as a motto that the church has chosen for faith and life, went out, pick up a, picked up a sword, and went to battle out there against those Muslims. And not just one time, not just two times, dozens upon dozens upon dozens, and not just during the Crusades. And by that Crusades, I mean the year between the years of, 12, of 1092 and 1291. They went to it beginning in the 7th century when the Muslims first attacked, when they first came out of Arabia. And they did it for centuries longer. Get this through your heads. The days of old are coming back to us. History has come full circle again. They're coming for you. They are, they are hunting you. What are you going to do? You can't run away from them. You have to run at them. That is the only way you are going to be able to combat them. Yes, your faith first, prayers first. But then, translate that into action. And if you're not sure how to do it, get my book. It, for me, it's less about the sales of my book. I could care less about that right now. What I'm more concerned about is using the example. These are people who lived Islam. They know Islam by lived experience. And you will find they consistently have the same responses to this problem. Yes, people have different vocations. You need to live your vocation. You need to discern that. That is between you and God. And it's very important that you follow it no matter what it is. That comes first. But that having said, there are many different vocations that, want, that people have lived. Read about them. Learn them. Find out where you fit in. And then follow it. Because, like I've said, the, this is a historical crossroads. We are either going to stand up to these people and drive them back into the deserts of Arabia, or your descendants are going to bow down and worship Allah facing Mecca. Those are your choices right here. I laid them out before you. One or two. There's no third choice. There's no way around this. There are millions of these people that your traitorous Western governments, our governments, have brought in here thinking they could control for socio-political reasons. The same error that many empires throughout history have made, not just European, many other countries too. You can control Islam until you can't. And we are realizing that now that they're in our own backyards. There you you want a way to find out how to stop these guys? Find the mosques where they went to. There you That's have the it. first part. All right, hold that thought for just a minute. 844-527-8723, uh, our telephone number. It's the Mike Church Show here on the Crusade Channel, part of the Veritas Radio Network, Radio the Way. It should be Andrew Bizot, author of the Lions of the of Lions of the Faith, book that you can find in a Kindle download at Amazon.com, and our resident Islamic scholar um, is is trying to rally the crowd here. Um, I don't think you have to rally uh, very many of them because I think that they're already now that they're aware and now that the history of Islam Islam is now actually being retaught and relearned. But uh, something you said that that interested me about running towards them. I'm yeah. reading right now, and it's very lengthy. It's almost 60, uh, 50 pages long in Alban Butler's Lives of the Saints and the uh, Lives of the Saints, Doctors and Fathers of the Church. Um, I'm reading the history of Saint King Louis the Ninth, or Louis the Ninth, as he called him. 
And I'm at the part I'm reading right now where he actually went. He went on a crusade. He went to the Holy Land, and uh, uh, or to Egypt, rather. And he was stuck on one side of the Nile River, and they had to, they had to wait until they could figure out a way to get around it because the Mohammedans would, uh, would shoot him every time they tried to get into the river. They'd, uh, they'd arrow them down. And that they ultimately got across the river, uh, and they were camped out there for like three months until someone showed them this, this fjord of sorts where they could go around. Um, and they ultimately, they, they, now this is the king of France. He doesn't have to do this. He could order somebody to do it. Um, and they, they get across the Nile River, and then they go to chase the Mohammedans, but they get a little, uh, a little excited, and they chase too far, and their ranks get thinned out, and, and, and St. King Louis ultimately winds up being captured. And he was tortured for months and months on end until uh, he agreed to, play, uh, to pay, I guess. Now, what would you, what, 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 help me out here. Did he pay the Mohammedan warlord, and I can't remember his name, a Jazia? I forget his name. I, have, I think I have it written down in my book, but it was a very large sum of money. I want to say it was about 100,000 gold pieces, which is a very large amount of money, uh, even for today's number. Right, right. And so now, what happens at the end? So, so say King Louis chased the Mohammedans, and he, he went to the whole, he went to Egypt to go find them, and to go take them out. Um, so there is some precedent. There's a, a precedent to this for those that uh, you know. I talk about just war all the time. Was this a just war? Of course it is. And I should add to that too. It's more than just the concept of just war, because the war is yes, it is just. But at the same time, again, under, looking at it from the the Catholic faith has always said war is it's not a good thing, but it is a fact of human life. It is something that we encounter. And when dealing with this, and there are rules to it, there are ways to go about it. The, the issue with Islam is Islam, by its own theology, and th this is not me saying it, because personally, I, I don't want war. I don't like war. War is there's no good for anybody. But the fact is, Islam, by its own theology, has been at war with us for 14 centuries, since its inception. Because it declares war against all non-Muslim peoples. I have been commanded to fight against mankind until he confesses that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his slave and messenger. This is the declaration of war. And as Muhammad said, Verily, paradise is under the shade of swords. This is, again, the understanding of Muhammadan paradise is one of power, money, and sex, the acquisition of, the, of thereof, and the destruction of non-Muslims for the sake of Allah, by any and all means possible. Because, as I've said before on your show, non-Muslims are not human. You see, when you, the, the more power that Islam gains in a society, not only do they act up, like we saw in this church, but you see the true face of Islam. The mask comes off. You see Islamic theology in practice, and you see the fruits of it. And that's when, when you start to see that, it's at that point you've reached an existential decision. Do you fight or do you submit? And that's a question you have to answer. 844-527-8723 is our telephone number. 